time constraints. Uh, malware, okay, so the second big topic in this uh, chapter, uh, malicious software. Okay, uh, first of all, you know, malware is not really a new concept. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, it's not so much today, but you know, even a few years ago, every time there was some new uh, malware threat show up, you get these sort of hysterical reports and it sound like this is something new and the world's coming to an end. It's not really the case. It's been around for a long time. Now, at least since the 1980s, there was some uh, academic work uh, by this guy, Fred Cohen, uh, and his original motivation was to break multi-level security systems. Okay? So he would get a virus installed on somebody's computer, and they would have a top secret clearance, and all their top secret documents would get, you know, suddenly be available to someone who didn't have a top secret clearance. Okay, so it's a, you know, sort of an uh, obvious way to break a multi-level security system. Uh, okay, now, there's a lot of different ways to classify malware. Uh, we'll primarily be concerned with viruses and worms. Okay, so the distinction there between a virus and a worm is that a virus, at least in our terminology, will be that a virus propagates passively. Okay, someone, there has to be some other activity to cause the virus to uh, propagate. You know, in the old days, what was it? You get a floppy disk from somebody, you put it in your computer, oh, you're infected with a virus because it was carrying the virus. Okay, so the virus is carried on the floppy disk. Okay, now um, virus writers or malware writers much prefer not to have to rely on somebody else. So today, they really like worms, which are implies active propagation, which really implies there's a network. Okay, so it's a uh, propagating over a, a network. Now, generically, uh, people use the term virus, and I probably will too, okay? So virus is kind of a generic term uh, as well. Uh, there are other, other types of malware that we'll look at briefly too. Okay, what about viruses? Where do they show up? Uh, they can be just about anywhere. They can be in the boot sector, which is good from a virus writer's perspective. You can kind of take charge before anything else. Even the malware detection system kicks in, and you can try to hide, okay? That's a, a good approach. Uh, some viruses are mem said to be memory resident. They just stay active in memory uh, until you shut down or something uh, something severe like that. Uh, they could be in applications, macro data, library, anywhere. They can be anywhere, <laughs> kind of the bottom line. This one I like. They could be in your virus checking software. That would be really good, right? Okay. I assume your virus checking software isn't a virus. <laughs> Yeah, be careful what you download. Some of those virus checking softwares, free virus scan, okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna look at some examples of malware, uh, some historical examples, um, and go through these pretty quickly. Um, the brain, so-called brain virus, one of the first uh, viruses, so that's actually sort of hotly debated what was the first virus. We don't care, okay, this is an early one. It's a good example. Uh, then the Morris worm, okay, so notice we go from virus to worm, okay, so active propagation. In 1988, that's really early, uh, and that worm had some really interesting features, and it's still a really, you know, very advanced for its time, so it's something worth looking at. Okay, then we kind of jump ahead to sort of a, a, a little more modern examples, Code Red and Slammer. And then sort of the current fashion in malware tends to be a little different than what was popular even just a few years, a few years ago. Okay, so botnets seem to be the thing. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the future of malware. Um, I should warn you, I guess malware is kind of one of my favorite topics. So, you know, my master's students uh, probably believe the majority of them do uh, malware related projects. So bear with me here. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the brain virus, okay, this is very early from 1986. So uh, this one really did nothing <coughs> harmful, okay, it just sort of used up system resources. Uh, so people, not a lot, so people didn't really worry too much about it. It was, you know, there's no Norton antivirus in 1986, so it's actually very difficult to remove, and it's probably still out there on some machine somewhere, you know, so these things never go away. I guess it's important, I guess, because it's early and it's kind of a prototype. People <coughs> built on it for uh, later systems, uh, later malware. Okay, so what did it do? So it put itself in the boot sector, which is good, okay, and it put itself in some other locations. Now, every time uh, there was a, you were, in, every time you did an operation that was looking at the disk, okay, it would 
game, it would screen that call and it would say, oh, are they looking at a location where the virus is located? If it was, it wouldn't show the virus. <laughs> okay, so it's sort of hiding itself. It's sort of its whole purpose is just to hide itself from you know you seeing. Uh, and it would look each time it would look and see all if if it was still installed in all those locations on the disk where it put itself. If not, it would put itself back in those locations. So the point is this: it's not really doing anything harmful, but it's just trying to stay there. And if you got rid of one copy of it, it didn't matter. It would put itself back right away. So you sort of had to get rid of all the copies at the same time. And that was difficult to do, again, because there was no antivirus software to help you out. Okay, so people just kind of thought of, thought of it as a curiosity and didn't really uh, get too worked up about it. Okay, the Morris worm is kind of a very different beast, okay? So this came about in 1988. Okay, so now worm, again, what's the difference? Worm versus virus? Active, active propagation. So active propagation implies? There is a network, okay? 1988. Was there a network in 1988? I don't know. Weren't you born in 1988? Well, <laughs> That's a rhetorical question. Okay, so so um, there, there was a network, okay? But it's nothing like the Internet of today, okay? Don't even think about the Internet of today. Nothing like that. Okay, 1988. What did people do with the Internet? Debate people on Usenet. <laughs> they didn't go to Amazon.com and buy stuff. Okay, they certainly didn't do that. I mean, it was really designed for academic use. Okay, it was people, it was academic people sending email and telnetting to supercomputers. That was, you know, basically what it was for. Okay, and you know, how many nodes were on the on the internet? You know, it was not measured in the millions or billions. It was measured in the thousands. Okay, so you're talking thousands of nodes. Okay, so much different than today. Okay, so this is pretty early to be thinking about a worm, right? Okay, so this guy Morris, he came along and he decided to build this thing. Just he claims it's just an experiment, okay, to see what it, you know, see if he could do this sort of thing. And it escaped into the wild, of course, you know, accidentally, right? So okay, so what does it do? It tries to decide where it can spread. Okay, so is there any more places it can infect? Okay, so that's one thing. If it finds a susceptible host, it spreads its infection, and then it works to remain undiscovered. So again, it's kind of like the brain thing in that it's not intentionally doing anything malicious. It's just trying to spread its infection and you know remain undetected. Okay. Now uh, this is kind of the interesting. Morris claimed his worm had a bug. Okay. And it was supposed to look at systems and say, okay, that one's already infected, so I'll leave it alone. That part didn't work. So it tried to reinfect systems that were already infected. And think about it now, as it grows and it starts infecting more and more systems, each of those is going out trying to infect more and more systems. Okay, so basically the problem here was that it used up bandwidth. Okay, it just consumed all the available bandwidth at some point and people couldn't use the network. Right? Now it certainly could have been worse, right? I mean, as you'll see here in a second. Okay, so let's look at the different parts, okay? So what does it do to find vulnerable machines? Well, okay, it did uh, a few things. Uh, it tried password guessing. Okay, it has to get access to these machines, right? It has to get root access. These are all Unix machines. So it has to get root access to the machine, to the, to the server. So how is it gonna do that? Guess the password, of course. Uh, and there's actually a link here, you can go and look. Uh, it had a dictionary, a built-in dictionary of some 300 passwords, something like that, common passwords. Uh, it did a few other sort of clever things. It looked around the system, looked at the file structure, and based on the names in the file structure, it built sort of a customized dictionary. It had a few, you know, a few more uh, than 300 in effect. Uh, if that didn't work, then it tried to exploit a buffer overflow. There you go. Okay, uh, there was a well-known buffer overflow in a Unix utility at the time. Nobody bothered to patch the buffer overflow. Why did nobody bother to patch it? Because nobody thought about security. Who's going to attack? You know, we're just a bunch of academic people sending email and telnetting to supercomputers. And people didn't think about attacks in these points. Okay, so a well-known sort of problem was out there. There was also a trapdoor built into the sendmail utility. Um, 
it was there for debugging purposes. And again, everybody sort of knew this was there, and it was a potential vulnerability, but nobody you know, bothered to uh, patch it, so it was widely, uh, widely available uh, for attackers. Okay, now what does the Morris worm do once it gets accessed through one of those three means? Okay, it would send a uh, bootstrap list, a small chunk of C code uh, to the machine. It would compile that code and execute that code. Okay, now that code is going to go back to the sender and it's going to get all the bits and pieces of the worm and put those together and create the actual worm on this machine. Okay, it's a pretty sophisticated piece of software. So there's a lot involved to do that. Yeah. How big was the worm? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Off the top of my head. Um, okay, but this this guy is what's responsible for getting all the code, all the pieces, compiling the whole thing, getting it to work. Okay. So the bootstrap loader fetched the worm, did all kinds of sophisticated stuff, authenticated the sender. Right? It doesn't want to get a bad worm. Wants to get the right worm. Okay. So, <laughs> the sender. Uh, that's kind of the part that really gets me. Okay. Uh, other things, if the code was, if the transmission got interrupted, the bootstrap loader's job was to self-destruct, right? Delete all the code, all traces of itself, and clean up, okay? So people wouldn't know that anything funny had been going on. The code was encrypted when it was downloaded. So I mean, even if you were sniffing the packets going back and forth, it just looks like random bits. It's not obvious that there's something uh, funny going on here. <clears throat> Uh, deleted all sources, all traces of the source code. So even if you find the worm, you're stuck trying to reverse engineer it to figure out what's going on. You don't get the source code. Okay. Uh, when it's actually executing, the worm would change its process ID. So you uh, Unix users, right, if you do like a top or something like that, and it shows the top processes there, it would have a different name all the time. So you wouldn't see Morris worm up there at the top all the time. Okay, so bottom line on the Morris worm. Uh, this really was a shock to the internet community of 1980. Again, you have to remember it's completely different than the internet community of today, right? <laughs> Much different world. You know, people claim the internet was designed to withstand a nuclear war, right? It's this very distributed system, right? Uh, you know, it's sort of the ultimate distributed system. So if parts of it get damaged, the rest of it can survive. Yet, it was brought to its knees by a lone graduate student named Morris. And the best part is, you know, to add sort of conspiracy to the whole thing, Morris's father worked at NSA at the time. Ooh. Is he after? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think he kept working there for at least for a while. Uh, but the bottom line here is this thing could have been much worse, okay? So Morris had root access, right, to a lot of machines. He could have done all kinds of malicious stuff, but he didn't. I think that's probably what saved him, right, uh, from, you know, serious prosecution here. What was the ultimate result? There was some additional security awareness and a few sort of uh, kind of tepid measures put in place. But you know, the bottom line, to, from my perspective at least, is this should have been kind of a wake-up call. You know, look, the network has some serious problems here. Let's start over. <laughs> we only have a few thousand nodes. We can build some security architecture into the network at this point. That would be easy. They didn't. Okay, nothing, nothing even remotely similar to that happened. Today, you have billions of users. You can't do that. You can't just sort of start over. You know, see how, you know, just see how difficult it is to migrate to uh, IP version 6. You know, that's really slow. Is it ever going to happen? Nobody knows. At this time, if you had IP version 6, it's easy. Shut down the internet, start up next week, you know, we'll have IP version 6. So I think it's kind of an opportunity missed in a sense. <clears throat> 